Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we can get started. My name is Arma Khan al -Haq. I am the manager of Program Development Partnerships and Finance with the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. And uh, it's an honor for me to introduce our uh, guest speaker for today. Dr. Nitin Padmanabhan is currently working as a postdoc fellow in electrical and computer engineering at University of Waterloo. He has over seven years of research experience his research interests include demand response, energy storage applications, electricity market modeling and design, and optimization of power systems. Nitin has more than 11 years of experience in teaching university college students in Canada and India at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Nitin received his Bachelor of Technology and Master of Technology degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Calicut, Kerala in India in 2007 and 2010, respectively. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from University of Waterloo in 2019. He is also the recipient of the 2018 Energy Council of Canada ECC Energy Policy Research Fellowship Award, 2017 Faculty of Engineering Award, 2017 Best Teaching Assistant Award in Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Waterloo, and 2005 Best National Service Scheme Student Volunteer Award in Kerala, India. Nitin, the stage is all yours, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Armagan. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, WISE for this opportunity, uh, with, uh, which I can share some of my <clears throat> research experience in the area, uh, like which is very close to my heart and have been working for uh, last say five or six years. So today uh, I'll be uh, briefly giving you an overview of uh, battery energy storage system participation in wholesale electricity markets. I'll be touching upon the opportunities, challenges and practices. So this is a brief outline of my presentation. I'll start with uh, presenting some uh, figures, facts and figures, uh, which represent the growth trends for energy storage systems uh, specifically and uh, also for battery energy storage systems then i'll discuss some of the opportunities which uh, this uh, resource has uh, while offering its services in markets or power system then i'll be discussing touching upon some of the driving factors which has uh, led to a, a, a give this resource a great prominence uh, further i'll discuss the challenges so it's uh, the field is not that easy as it seems to be for this particular resource. So what are the challenges for battery energy solar systems to participate in electricity markets? I'll touch upon that. Then <clears throat> uh, uh, further, I'll be discussing upon the current operating regulations, some policies and the practices followed in uh, some, I'll touch upon uh, only a few of the ISOs in US, uh, citing some of the examples of uh, uh, markets in US and uh, only seeing a market in Ontario. And thereafter, <clears throat> I'll uh, give you a glimpse of uh, the research which I have done in this area and some of my propositions, which I believe are very valid in the present context. And finally, I'll have my conclusions. So let me start with uh, uh, giving you some uh, idea about how the storage growth seems to be. So this statistics shows that uh, uh, as per 2018, uh, the total cumulative installed power capacity of storage globally was around 6.4 gigawatts, which is expected to grow uh, in 2030, by 2030, by 49.5 gigawatts. When we talk about the energy capacity, uh, it's, it's see, we can see that it can, will grow from 16.5 gigawatt hours to 114 gigawatt hours. While talking about the revenues uh, in dollars, uh, billion, so it is growing from 3.7 billion to 8.4 billion, and specifically talking about uh, North America, that is U.S. and Canada, we see that uh, the trend is very promising. So, uh, at two, uh, in 2018, uh, the capacity was 1.2, which was 14% of the total global uh, capacity, is seen to be growing to 24%. Uh, to 14.5 gigawatt, the power capacity. Similarly, the installed capacity will see a growth of up to 13%. So on the right-hand side also have depicted the various uh, technologies. Uh, so this uh, is, uh, specifically applies to the capacity that was in 2020. Uh, so we can see that 
uh, among the various technologies. So uh, a point to note here, I have excluded the uh, pumped hydro storage, which accounts for the majority when we talk about storage, though uh, it is accounted in, uh, but I have excluded that. So by 2020, the total installed capacity was uh, around the world was about 159 gigawatt of which 96% comes from pump storage. So if we set aside that capacity though the remaining 4%, it comes from these technologies. And if we look further, what we see is the majority comes from molten uh, salt storage, which is uh, accounts for about 33%, which is what we call as thermal energy storage. And, but the when we look into the battery storage system, that is also very, very significant. So among them, the lithium ion battery is uh, stands apart. So which is about 25% of the total capacity globally. Now, when we look into uh, uh, understanding the figures from country-wise perspective, what we see, the maximum installed capacity is in US, then followed by Spain and Germany. So uh, we understand that there's huge scope or growth for the uh, energy storage system in general, and specifically for battery energy storage system. So, and also now uh, the figures which I'm presenting here, they apply to US and Canada. So uh, it was noted that by the end of 2018, about the total installed uh, storage capacity in US was 869 megawatt. Now, specifically, I'm talking about the battery energy storage system, because uh, what I feel, uh, it is one of the most uh, significantly adopted technologies because of the many benefit it offers and uh, uh, also, uh, like, uh, so this uh, talking about storage, so it's 869 megawatt of power capacity and about 1236 megawatt of energy capacity of the grid scale uh, battery energy storage system where, when was became operational in US. Among this, uh, the installed capacity about 90% comes from battery energy storage system. And that too, uh, the technology which is specifically used is lithium ion batteries because of the advantages which ha it has. Uh, another point we noted is 73% of the large battery storage system capacity. Uh, among it, about 70% energy capacity is installed in states which are actually under the jurisdictions operated by the various system operators. Uh, most of the uh, storage or battery energy storage system at this point of time, it provides uh, frequency regulation service in US. When we talk about Canada, specifically Ontario, uh, we understand there is about 105 megawatt install capacity of which 95 megawatt is through batteries. Compared to US, it's, uh, we can say it's uh, less, but uh, what we see is the kind of policies and reforms that is coming to the Ontario market, uh, the growth I'm very sure is very, very promising. Now, uh, talking about the, some of the value streams uh, which storage sees. So we can classify this into three areas. The services which it can offer, to the system operator or the uh, regional transmission operator, uh, which are basically uh, at the market level, procured through market mechanisms. The next level would be the utility services, which typically I would say uh, what it can offer to the system assets, the power system, improving the performance and efficiency of the power system. And then coming to the much lower end, to the customer end, where uh, the services which it can offer to the customers. So. Typically, I'll be focusing my work, my, uh, from my experience, I've been working in the area of market. So I'll be focusing on the services which it can offer to system operators or in electricity markets. So we see that storage can uh, participate to provide energy services, uh, reserve services, capacity in reserve markets, also in the capacity markets. At the same time, it can provide ancillary services such as voltage support and black star. So these are the different identified value streams. So we can see that. So there is ample scope. If there is a resource, a unit, it can choose. It has opportunity to choose between among these services. And this can lead to va value stacking, I would say service stacking. So these, uh, from this, we understand the, the figures are very promising. Uh, so there's a, uh, definitely we see there's a trend, growing trend for this resource to come into markets in both US. Already it is there, but the, score, the growth is much more promising. Now, I would like to touch upon some of the key drivers, the market drivers, which uh, actually uh, promotes uh, storage into the market or battery energy storage specifically. What I would say, the more, I have, uh, there are many drivers which uh, we can think about, but I have tried to uh, focus on five important aspects. So one is the global movement, the deployment of renewable energy resources. We see that. So here in this figure, what I have tried to uh, represent, uh, what I try to depict is 
the growth of energy, uh, the renewables from 2007 to 2021 uh, with forecast right so what we see is the growth is very steady right and uh, so at present the total renewable energy now uh, so this is per year installation so we see around in 2019 it was about 176 gigawatt of capacity was added and it also shows like the major countries where these projects were deployed so a uh, point which I noted here is we see, though this is a forecast, there is a depict in 2020, the year which went by and uh, further see. So uh, maybe no, unknowingly or unknowingly, uh, like this is a forecast, whether it would have an impact of COVID, which we all saw. Uh, and also we see the trend is positive, right? So we have uh, hope now, like the, it will come back uh, to the what growth was predicted. So at the end of 2019, uh, it was noted that the total capacity from renewable energy resources was about 2,537 gigawatt, of which majority, about 47% comes from hydropower, followed by wind, which contributes 25%, and then solar, which contributes about 23%. So uh, we understand uh, by 2050, it is estimated that about 90% of the capacity, close to 80 to 90% would be uh, provided by storage, uh, typically wind and solar. But there is a lot of things have to be taken into consideration for effective integration of this uh, uh, renewable energy source because of the intermittency and uh, the uh, intermittency and uncertainty which this resource poses. So it, this is one of the key areas which uh, is brings a lot of uh, opportunity for storage to come into the system. Second point I would uh, emphasize is most of the uh, power grids there are in a uh, process of transitioning to a low carbon economy, which was initiated by the Paris Climate Change Agreement, uh, where about 197 countries uh, uh, signed in the agreement with the target to reduce the global warming temperature about two degrees centigrade. For this, the countries have uh, actually uh, they have agreed upon reducing their carbon footprints, the greenhouse gas emission levels. So, for example, US, uh, it has pledged, it pledged at that time to reduce its 2005 levels by 26 to 28% by the year 2030. Well, when we talk about Canada, it has uh, it ha play or uh, planned to reduce it to 30% by uh, of 2005 levels by 2030. But when we talk about US, the current and the current situation, it, it seems to be too ambitious because uh, but right now it is only 12%. So there's way to go. So in order to move to a low carbon economy, there's another uh, scope where storage can play a big role. And it is also estimated that the market, so around $13.5 trillion of investment, additional investment would be required to achieve these goals. The next uh, point I would uh, say is uh, the buzzword flexibility. So we are the system operators. Now they are moving to, we are already understood, right? The, uh, so we cannot stop uh, uh, from the kind of deployment of energy storage, uh, sorry, the, the renewables which we are going to see. And we also have to be very cautious about when this resource, renewable energy sources, they come into the market. So this actually demands for flexibility op uh, options for the system operator. And this is where the storage can shift in, a battery storage. So I, uh, just through a uh, pictorial representation, so maybe uh, right now, a little bit uh, during this decade, what we see when we talk about flexibility, so typically it comes from, mainly you see it will be coming from the supply or the generation resources, right? But moving for, and other, uh, uh, other participants or resources like grid and demand, it didn't have much say, maybe say a few years ago, but moving ahead, what we see is when we talk about flexibility, a major role is going to be played by two resources, what I would say storage and the, uh, the distributed energy resources. So see, so this we can see, we, these are two resources which will provide a great amount of flexibility to the system operator. So this flexibility can come from demand, through demand response, uh, generation resources, fast acting generation resources can provide flexibility. Also, uh, this can be achieved at the distribution level uh, through distributed energy resources. So when we talk about flexibility, especially uh, about energy storage, the key characteristics which uh, characterize flexibility is basically is fast response time. 
which means it can switch on and off instantaneously. It's ramping capability. It can ramp at very high rate. And then another uh, important feature is the storage can act both as generator and load. So these features make it a important contributor of flexibility service into the market. So this is another important driving force for bringing more storage into markets and the system. Next, I would say a key factor is the cost and performance improvement. So over the years, we have seen that, uh, specifically I have given you an example of lithium ion batteries uh, cost. So we see that from 2010 to 2017, the cost has considerably reduced. I would say around close to 80%, which is very, very significant. And also compared to other technologies, uh, battery energy storage system, uh, and specifically lithium ion technology is now pretty much matured. So that uh, gives confidence to bring in this easily into the markets and the system. And then I would say another important factor is what we look into the grid mod modernization. Everyone is talking, uh, the smart grids like that has been there for, I would say last 25 years or so, but specifically emphasizing on affordable electricity. That is one area. So the aging infrastructure in many of the developing countries, it needs to be modernized and it has to be expanded so that it would be able to serve rapidly the growing population at the same time to bring power to an estimated a large chunk is still, uh, they are deprived of electricity at this point of time. So the system operators and the policy makers are working towards it. So about 30% of the global population doesn't have a uh, affordable as access to electricity at this point of time. So according to the United Nations uh, initiative, it is estimated that around $45 billion investment is going to happen by the year 2030, which will uh, help to provide, uh, real, uh, I would say, uh, affordable electricity to uh, many of the people who are deprived. And this is another area where storage can play a very important role. So these are some of the, uh, I, I see, these are some of the major market driving forces which, is, which uh, actually advocate for bringing more storage into the system and into the electricity markets. Now, as I said, we understand there's an ample scope, opportunity, everything, trend show, all these things. But is the path easy? Can this resource easily be integrated? I doubt about it because there are some key challenges which still has to be addressed. So some of the challenges which I have highlighted here, I try to classify, I see it in terms of there are two kinds of what we see. One is there is an important need for policy and regulatory interventions. So say for example, uh, I would say two years back, Storage could, they, uh, we had a situation where st storage couldn't participate in electricity markets at par with other traditional resources like generators and loads. At that time, I, I was, uh, specifically example of US. So their FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, it brought an order, FERC order, I'll be discussing about in detail in uh, one of my future slides. So that intervention actually paved way for storage to enter into electricity market. So we need more uh, solid, uh, this kind of regulations and policies to be framed. Another thing I would say, still there is a notion that, though, we, uh, though I cited the prices are going down, but still there's a notion that the overall project cost is still very high, right? But uh, when we talk about a technology uh, or resource like storage, more than cost minimization or optimal, looking into more optimal cost, we should also take into account the kind of services it provides. So for that, there needs to be incentive or motivation for owners to invest more into this. So that is one key area still, I would say, an important challenge. There needs to be appropriate incentives. So for, for example, uh, taking the case of Ontario also, I understand, though there has been a very strong initiative to bring in storage, but still, uh, the IESO is working on how, what kind of incentives can be provided. Most, right now, mostly it is through contractual mechanism, but how can this be improved? How can this be more, made more efficient? So this is one key challenge. Then I would say there are flaws in the market design. So uh, with this uh, FERC order coming in, more, the markets, they were mandated to allow storage to participate in the market. But the design, it was, uh, I would say outdated, it was not that easy to directly allow this resource to participate. So there the question comes, how, what would be the changes that should be made 
to incorporate this uh, so that changes be made so that the storage can be easily incorporated to the existing market model. So there we need to look into storage has uh, uh, what makes it uh, different from traditional generation, I would say is the storage is an energy limited resource. So that's why it is very, very important to capture or understand the physical and operational characteristics of this resource. And that needs to be taken into account whenever we consider its participation in the market and the system. So I, I would say that another important challenge is to prop appropriately account for or capture the physical and operational characteristics of this resource uh, because of the uh, kind of uh, operational it has, it's the charging, discharging, etc., which impacts uh, significantly its life. And also, as I cited, it's a limited energy resource uh, as compared to generators. For generators, the, if you have fuel available, you can operate your generator as long as you want, but that is not case with a battery energy storage system. Another thing is, okay, so we start with this, then how, when, if they're even allowed to, how would be their bidding mechanism? So would it be very traditional kind of price quantity pairs or would they bid in a different kind of uh, uh, arrangement where uh, it will actually uh, take into account, as I said the previously, is physical and operational characteristics. That is, uh, say for example, uh, what uh, from my experience I would say is, again, since this is an energy limited resource, so should we look into, should storage bid in terms of its capacity rather than well? So these kind of things still has to be sorted out. Next is very, very important thing. So what I, there's a next hurdle is the state of charge management. Again, coming back to the same point, storage is a limited energy resource. So there are various ways in which uh, the system operators uh, manage. So uh, typically talking about it, like self management of state of charge, should it be managed by the unit itself? Should the uh, system operator look into it, keep a track on the state of charge of the resource and uh, so should that be considered when the uh, optimization or the market is being settled? So these kind of questions still exist. So which is the best method that can be used? Then coming is uh, coming to is what is the problem I would say is aggregation. So we understand there is a lot of uh, developments happening at the grid scale storage, but at the same time, we have storage at the distribution level or DERs, right? So for them to participate in wholesale electricity market, there needs to be a mechanism where they can come under the umbrella of aggregators. So how would, what would be the rules or what should be the policies that should be considered for the aggregators to come into the market? This is another important challenge. So these are the challenges I see uh, in spite of the opportunities and uh, positive, it has still these important uh, challenges have to be tackled such that the storage can be, or battery and storage can be effectively integrated into the electricity markets. Now, next, I'd like to uh, take you through some of the current regulations, policies, and practices in US and Canada. So, uh, so the electricity market in US and Canada, so they typically are, uh, there are, uh, so the two countries, uh, in US, there are seven markets that operate. So among these seven markets, six markets, they operate under jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC. And one is a standalone entity which operates in the state of Texas, which is the ERCOT, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas. So these are the seven market operators or uh, the independent system operators in US. When we talk about that, there are two system operators which is the Independent Electricity System Operator of Ontario, that IESO, and the Alberta Electricity System Operator, AESO. So these are the uh, seven plus two, nine ISOs or RTOs operating in North America. Now, I talked about uh, like uh, an important uh, hurdle which has to be overcome is uh, policy intervention, right? So here I would like to touch upon two key policies or Regulating, regulatory measures, I would say they were, uh, I'll call them landmark orders, which actually helped storage to come and enter into the electricity market. So one was uh, what we uh, what came in 2011, the FERC order 755, uh, which actually uh, provides more incentive for fast response resources. So this uh, specifically looks into what we call as a performance-based regulation. This specifically applies to performance-based re regulation markets. So in performance-based regulation, uh, while considering pricing, there are two important aspects to be considered. 
so how is the speed of response of the resource which is providing this regulation service and how accurately it follows so so for providing regulation service actually uh, the system operator sends a signal the agc signal so and the uh, the providers the regulation providers have to follow the signal so how accurately that signal is followed so these two these two things have to be captured now uh, participant in performance regulation market it actually receives two part payment so one is a payment what is called the regulation capacity payment and the second one is a performance payment so regulation capacity payment is something like as a storage if i commit myself i will provide say uh, 0.5 megawatt of capacity so even if i am called or not called i sh i will get a payment for that so kind of like the still the same uh, what we have the uh, reserve pay payment for other reserve uh, reserves such as spinning reserve non spinning reserve so just for committing capacity to be, for your availability the payment part that is regulation capacity payment the second uh, payment part is what we call the performance payment so actually uh, when you get a signal and you provide this regulation service so how did you perform so based on that uh, you receive or the, the storage receives a payment so this is just a depiction of the regulation capacity and regulation mileage so here i have shown two resources resource a and resource b so basically uh, so they are uh, so what we see is the resource a is a fast acting resource right so from even zero we can consider the, we can say let's say this is a battery energy storage so right at instant of time it can provide this particular capacity and the other one is a kind of a traditional generator so the the regulation capacity is basically the reserve capacity of the unit to provide regulation power, power during a specified period of time and the regulation mileage is its movement how did it move so here it moved from 0 to 10 megawatt so basically that is its regulation mileage so here it moved from 0 to 6 megawatt right so that is the mileage or the movements that have to be continuously captured now talking uh, talking about the next important uh order uh, i would say is the fork order 841 uh, which uh, came to effect in february 2018 uh, in U us juris us jurisdiction uh, also the markets under uh, fork uh, so our court doesn't come under that purview so what does this fork order say so the summary is basically it gives a standard definition for electric energy storage resources secondly it establishes a participation model for the storage resources to provide whatever uh, services they are capable of so there should be no discrimination the fork order says there should be no discrimination for a storage to participate in market to provide energy ancillary services such as reserves or capacity at par with other resources and it should ensure that the storage if dispatched and cleared should be uh, Uh, so ensure es is dispatched and they can set the market prices so it should be ensured and then it accounts for the physical and operational characteristics of the uh, energy storage system and then uh, it established a minimum capacity so the minimum capacity it should not exceed 100 kilowatt earlier it used to be in range of megawatt 1 megawatt 5 megawatt so that was brought down with this fork order coming in and then the sale and purchase of energy should be done at the L, uh, using lmp so in us market the locational marginal prices so if storage participant it will receive lmp or it will pay uh, charge at by paying lmp and then also it talks about the state of charge management so uh, how should be um, uh, emphasis given to state of charge management should it be done by the storage owner should the system operator have a say in that so those kind of things so this is in general the summary what the fork order 841 touches upon So next, <clears throat> I would like to uh, give an idea of like how the present situation or status of storage is. Uh, so I have I'll be talking about three markets in US and then two markets in, uh, or one market in Canada. So in PGM, so PGM was one of the uh, leading or one of the first markets to bring in a lot of storage in stock, very specifically battery and storage system. So at this point of time, there is about three hundred megawatt. and or 176 megawatt or capacity of store, storage under operation in uh, pgm market so which mainly comes from 90% of it comes from the battery storage and energy storage system so right now they are participate only to provide regulation service but with the uh, implementation of fork order 841 
uh, storage would soon. So the market design uh, is uh, done and it's operational and they will soon start participating by submitting bids and offers for other energy, especially, specifically energy service in the market. And then the PGM market, so the well-established market where storage participates is the regulation market. So they are also, there are two, uh, which the earlier I was talking about the signal which the uh, resource which is providing regulation receives, what we call it as the AGC signal. So there are two kinds of re, uh, signals in PGM, what we call the Reg A and Reg D signal. So Reg A signal is basically uh, for slow resources. So this signal is followed by resources which are slow. Say for example, uh, steam turbine, right? And then the Reg D signal, uh, which is typically followed by resources which are very fast. For example, battery energy storage system or a combustion turbine, a generator based combustion turbine. So this is uh, just a depiction of, so what we see here is the green signal. So this is what the desired response is, right? Uh, but uh, a resource which is a traditional resource which follows a reggae signal, we see there is a lot of mismatch. The accuracy is not that good. So typically around 70 to 80%, right? But on the contrary, when we look into the reg D kind of signal, what we see is, so which is being followed. So we see, say for example, the battery. So the green, which is the desired output or the desired regulation service needed and the storage is uh, very closely following that. So these are the two kinds of resources uh, uh, which operate in PGM. So now the regulation market in PGM is a performance-based market where the storage submits two part offers. One is for capacity, the other is for mileage. And the, the incentives are higher for the energy storage following Reg D. Because uh, like I uh, mentioned earlier, the performance, the speed at which the regulation signal is followed, that should receive an additional payment. So because of that payment, the incentives are higher. And to, for the, to account for Reg D, there is a mileage factor which is typically on average two to three times between two, a factor between two to three compared to that of the Reg A signal. And Reg D signal is designed to be zero mean energy, which means basically, uh, so energy, net energy would be kind of zero. So the storage would be required to provide both up and down kind of regulation. So the effectively the energy would be net zero. So the, the advantage of this is it helps to keep the storage at its desired state of charge. So if it charges, discharges, accordingly. So that will help to maintain the state of charge of the storage. Talking about the CAISO market, uh, California ISO, uh, the installed capacity is about 180 megawatt and, uh, and uh, power capacity and energy capacity is 500 thermo. So a point, uh, interesting point to note here is if we go back what we see. So the PGM market, the power. So PGM is focusing more on power cap power rating, I would say megawatt capacity. While the, the Kaiso market, it is more relying on the energy capacity. So this is a point which I noted, like so a market. So it depends on what kind of service do you want from the storage? So that is what basically decide. So if you want to invest or deploy more power rating, you have more power rating of the storage or is it more the energy rating? So now in uh, the California market, the storage battery energy storage system, it offers and bids as a non-generator resource so these are the markets where it can participate in the day ahead and real time energy market and real time reserve markets and also in the regulation market where it participates as a regulation energy management unit it's called a rem unit so the minimum capacity so there is 0.5 megawatt for 1 hour ahead market and 0.5 megawatt for 30 uh, minutes market so this would change this capacity would change with the order 841 because it has to be maintained minimum at 100 megawatt oh, sorry 100 kilowatt so now uh, this specifically, California ISO designed this regulation energy management system for energy limited resources such as storage. So what it does is the difference. So the traditional non-REM resources, they are supposed to provide continuously 60 minutes of energy. They need to commit. But on the contrary, the REM resources such as battery storage, it is required to commit only for 15 minutes. So this is just an example. So a traditional resource, for providing regulation, it would be asked to provide for uh, its commitment should be for a complete one hour. On the contrary, for the uh, storage, it would be for uh, 15 minute duration. And also uh, the REM resource can submit preferred SOC level. So basically at what close to what level they would like to operate. 
and REM units. So the disadvantage is these units part can participate only in regulation market. They don't provide energy service. It's quite obvious, right? 15 minute window. Now coming into the New York ISO. Uh, so the installed capacity of battery is 20 megawatt, 40 megawatt, but there's huge uh, uh, policy uh, reforms happening in New, New York jurisdiction where uh, they want to bring in more and more storage. So the estimate is to bring in about 2.5 to 3 gigawatt hour of storage capacity by the year 2030. So a lot of incentives and support, financial support is being considered or under uh, process, under discussion. So there uh, in New York also uh, the storage uh, technologies like flywheel and batteries there. So right now uh, storage <clears throat> predominantly participates in the regulation market, but however, uh, the New York uh, ISO was one of the first ISOs to implement or uh, come up with a design for, for them uh, to Im uh, incorporate the for quarter 841. So storage will, uh, I, I believe they have started bidding in the energy market too. And then there are two levels of monitoring. So in New York ISO, what they call the New York ISO monitored energy level, where the state of charge would be monitored by the New York ISO and the lower and higher uh, rating of state of charges um, 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 mentioned. And so within, so this goes into the auction model. So continuously the system operator ensures that the storage is within its operating level, the maximum upper limit and the lower limit of state of charge. And uh, also uh, there is option for the self-monitored energy level where uh, the system operator is not bothered about the state of charge uh, level of the unit. It's, it has to be maintained by the uh, owner uh, or the operator of that unit. So both options are available in New York market. Uh, New York market, uh, proposes to include these uh, parameters, bidding parameters uh, when the storage submit is bid, the upper level storage limit, maximum minimum load, uh, the maximum minimum withdrawing time limit, withdrawing response rate, round trip efficiency, state of charge, and uh, initial state of charge, etc. So now coming into uh, the market we have in our province, Ontario. Uh, which is uh, operated by the, or administered by the IESO, the Independent Electricity System Operator. So Ontario has, as a par part of, even before the market renewal program uh, was initiated, Ontario uh, wanted to bring in or uh, capture the advantage of storage. So with that, actually uh, the Ontario long-term energy plan in 2013, it proposed initiatives to uh, make best use of the value of energy storage in Ontario. And this was done in phases. So there were two phases. So procuring initially, uh, it was decided to procure 50 megawatt of different type of storage. And then a smart grid fund was uh, created to support various storage projects uh, to make best use of their capabilities in the distribution system level. And also to look into the studies where the benefits of storage can be, uh, be uh, in the best possible way understood. So this uh, was under the Ontario long-term energy plan. And a recent initiative, which Ontario has, IESO has taken is to set up a energy storage advisory group, which looks into uh, or what is working on how to uh, the design mechanism, the rules, et cetera, uh, which, uh, with which the storage can be incorporated into the Ontario market. So at this point of time, uh, there is about 105 megawatt of storage uh, capacity procured or at least contracted in Ontario and for of which, so this was done in two stages. So phase one and phase two, and they participate mainly at this point of time to provide regulation service in Ontario. And among this, so the, uh, the various resources which provide, so there are about eight battery units in phase one, there were about eight battery units which provide 25 Point, close to 25 megawatt capacity. There were flywheels, hydro gas generated, uh, hydrogen gas storage. And also in 2007, about 55 megawatt of additional storage through two battery uh, projects was added. And then uh, also there were, so uh, the main aim of uh, phase one was basically to provide regulation, reactive support and voltage control services. On, on the other hand, also it was considered to provide 
capacity to the grid. So there were this further eight so battery storage projects and one case project, I believe close to two megawatt uh, here near Godrich is operating. So as of now, so the what uh, the in Ontario, it is mainly through contractual arrangement. So the IESO uh, gets into contract with the storage owner to provide. So when called for, the storage has to provide the uh, service. But ideally, so what uh, IESO at this time is envisioning is to move into a, uh, a, a scenario where storage can participate at like other resources in the market, like in US basically. So uh, till this point, so what I tried to uh, touch upon is uh, to show like what are the important driving factors for storage then at the same time, understand, identify the challenges for storage to participate in the market. And then uh, what is the current situation, like how uh, situation in the markets in US. Huh? So in the next section, I'd like to uh, briefly touch upon some of the, uh, my research, like what I have done in this area. Uh, so how storage can participate, uh, the models which are proposed for, specifically battery and storage systems to participate in electricity markets. So as I said, uh, with the so the motivation for this work comes from uh, the FERC order 841, which mandated the system of uh, the system operators to allow storage to participate in market by submitting bids and offers, which actually capture their operational, physical, and operational characteristics. Right. So, uh, so when I was thinking about it, so the thing is when a generator participates in a market, right. So typically it knows it's short-term operational cost, which comes from its fuel cost. So, but when a storage needs to participate into the market, what would be its operational cost? So this is what an important problem I was trying to address. So what I propose or what I uh, realize is, so in order to effectively participate in electricity markets, the bids and offers should reflect the marginal operating cost of the storage system. And then I propose this, uh, operational cost of a storage, short-term operational cost of a storage could comprise of three components. What is the degradation cost, which is based on its depth of discharge and discharge rate, the flexibility cost, and the spinning reserve cost. So I'll touch upon, uh, because of limited time, I'll touch upon only on the first cost component. So the battery storage degradation cost function. So this was one of my key contributions. So the battery degradation mechanism, uh, literature, it's uh, from literature, it is understood that the battery degradation mechanism has the most significant impact on operational cost of a battery storage system. Now, what, on what factors it depends on? It depends on factors such as depth of discharge, how deep the battery discharges, the discharge rate, I would say uh, to understand simply how fast you discharge from 0.8 or 80% SOC to 40% SOC. So the depth is 40. And so in what time? Is it in five minutes, 15 minutes, one hour? So that is another important. So that is captured through discharge rate. And then the state of charge, the ambient temperature, et cetera. So uh, to keep my modeling simple, I made some assumptions and I uh, neglected the impact of ambient temperature, et cetera. And state of charge was considered as a uh, constraint in the model. So what I uh, focused on is two important param uh, factors. That is the depth of discharge how deep the battery is discharging and how fast it is discharging. So here the, uh, the characteristic shows. So the impact on the number of cycles that a battery storage unit would be able to give it if it operates at a particular discharge rate, uh, sorry, depth of discharge. If it depletes from 100 to zero continuously, so this very less number of cycles it would be able to provide. But uh, on the other hand, looking into how the it impacts the life cycle, uh, considering the discharge rate, so discharge rate is uh, maybe for an uh, audience who have uh, directly not from this background. So discharge rate is basically, we call a discharge rate of one. So if a battery storage unit is fully charged, fully 100%, and it discharges completely 100 to zero in one hour, then we say that it has a discharge rate of one C or one C rate. If it discharges 100 to zero within 30 minutes, so we say it has a discharge rate of two C. And on the contrary, if discharges 100 to zero in two hours, so we say it's a discharge rate of 0 0.5. So this, the from tests, it is uh, uh, it was known like how it affects the life cycle. So what I did in my work was to capture or bring in these two 
phenomena together and relate it to the cost. So this shows the degradation cost of a battery storage system based on depth of discharge and discharge rate. Now, uh, what I uh, would like to highlight is the state of charge is the st important state variable of a storage system. So I propose that the, this, the depth of discharge, discharge rate, it should be modeled in terms of the state of charge. So what we see here is the degradation cost, which actually brings together the impact phenomena of depth of discharge and discharge. Now we under, so you can see that this is a non-linear equation, right? So the kind of models we have, the market auction models we have, they typically have the, their linear models, right? So the next challenge was to linearize this equation. So that is what I did uh, in the second, uh, the second uh, part of my research. So linearizing this. So basically what I did was I differentiated, so separated them based on the uh, discharge rates. So I understood how would be the, how would the life uh, cycle be impacted at this area. Also see here it's uh, considering the depth of discharge. So we have two things. So one, the depth of discharge, the variation of life cycle, uh, the number of cycles with depth of discharge and for different uh, discharge rate scenarios or conditions. And then I came up with a data set. So basically what we see here is, I would say three uh, variables. So one is, uh, so to capture depth of discharge, we need state of charge at instant K, instant K minus one, and to capture discharge rate, again, discharge rate can be represented. In terms. So when we vary these three variables, so representing the, the uh, degradation cost function uh, in, in terms of these variables, and then using a, a multi-linear regression method, I came up with a cost function, which is uh, looks like this. So what we see here is a linearized model, which can be easily integrated into the uh, ma existing market frameworks, or market auction models. So uh, some, uh, of you might think like this is a this also is a nonlinear equation how it can be done right so what I would like to say here is the impact of discharge rate it is to be noted that actually in a day head kind of uh, operation even if it's a day head operation the battery would operate in a range between 0 0.1 to 1 so in that discharge range what we see its operation is very linear and even if we consider like the real time operation it would operate somewhere between close as high as three to five c. Uh, C rate, right? So still, uh, this holds good. The linearization does not affect the accuracy much, much. So this is the degradation cost of a battery, a linearized degradation cost. So where A, B, C, D are actually the coefficients, which I propose this can be the bidding parameters. So the storage owner can submit this as parameters into the uh, market, like uh, generator does. A, B, C, the, co the cost coefficient of its uh, cost function, fuel cost function, and similarly. So this was my first uh, contribution uh, to come up with a uh, cost function model for a storage system. So this is from the perspective of a storage owner. So if I'm a storage owner, what I would like to know is how, what would be the kind of operational cost I would incur? So on what aspect it depends on? It depends on the uh, physical phenomena. So I captured that. So the, uh, it gives uh, the opportunity uh, to the storage owner to understand its operational cost. At the same time, the advantage for the system operator is the, there's a, now a mechanism where the, this can be used as bids to participate in the market. Now, next is to integrate this into the uh, market model. So this is a, a summary of the market model uh, which I developed, mathematical model. So the objective function is to maximize social welfare. So this is a model for storage system to participate in day ahead market. Okay? So, so there are uh, the traditional participants such as generators, loads, and then storage comes in. Or, uh, in total work, I consider demand response also. So then uh, what are the constraints? So demand supply balance, which ensures the supply and generation meet at, uh, um, at each node. So this I developed for uh, LMP market but this can be easily implemented for a market what we have in Ontario, the UMP, my uniform mar marginal price market also. And then subject to other important constraints such as market clearing constraints, the storage models, uh, some 
uh, specific models, uh, novel models, I don't know, which capture, which actually brings in or captures the physical characteristics of storage in this arbitrage and spinning reserve constraints, operational constraints, they are standard existing constraints, and then spinning reserve uh, constraints, uh, transmission line constraints, and the unit commitment constraints. So this is the uh, auction mathematical model for the day ahead the battery storage system integrated they had market model now uh, to give you some brief uh, results so i tested my proposition or uh, my proposed model on ieee rts 24 bus system and so this shows the dispatch of uh, the storage units so i consider about 10 units participating at different locations so so what we see here is basically it tries to make best use of the arbitrary energy arbitrary so charging during the off peak hours so these are the off peak hours and then there are two peak hours also where it discharges and further uh, may, the significant discharge happens during the peak hours so when we look into the market prices so what we see here is so uh, I reported the lmp for a particular bus we see that so i consider three cases so where case one is the base case no storage participation case two is when it participates using the existing mechanism where the storage participates, uh, submit bids and offers just in price and quantity. So there's no much details available. So the disadvantage is it does not capture the actual cost, the degradation cost. So that is the disadvantage with case two. And with the case three is my proposed method where the storage participates by submitting or knowing its degradation cost and then submits bids and offers accordingly. So it is noted that with the storage participating in the market has resulted in reducing, help to reduce the market prices during the peak hours. Uh, so that is an important uh, result which was observed. And then uh, I'm coming to the conclusion. So what I would say uh, from my experience, we uh, definitely uh, literature from literature also we understand the growth of storage, energy storage and specifically battery energy storage system is very, very encouraging. But I would say there are a few things which needs to be considered while considering storage integration in electricity. One is to consider flexibility, to give more emphasis to flexibility or the, the important uh, service ca uh, characteristics of these resources rather than focus. So if we need uh, uh, want to integrate storage into so first we should look into is what kind of service we want right so more than focusing into the technology the more important thing is uh, the kind of characteristics or the value we want of the storage that should be uh, the key factor in designing storage or bringing storage into uh, the markets then uh, continuously there has to be because with the markets um, the framework then it needs to be further more encouraging more motiv motiv motivation for storage owners to come and participate in the market uh, and ontario needs further more more kind of those interventions and then also as understood it's more beneficial for storage to participate in ancillary services and for to provide flexibility services to uh, to explore more in that area so what i would say is with storage coming into the markets, uh, the, the impacts are multifold. <clears throat> Advantages are multifold. From the system perspective, it will help the system operator to balance the system, supply, demand, and balance. From the so societal aspect, it can help to uh, basically help the system operators to reduce cost, right? The energy, the electricity prices, may, uh, it may help to reduce the electricity prices. Uh, which is basically, uh, which results in bringing down the cost for us, the even at the customer, my, my electricity utility bill will go down, right? Also, uh, the storage owners will get revenue. So it's basically a win-win situation for everyone. And ultimately, the environmental aspect, like it can contribute to move towards a low carbon economy. So this is what I have to uh, present. And these are some of the research publications I have in this area. And I would like to thank uh, all my um, attendees for their patient listening. I would be happy to take some questions. Now. If also discussions, uh, like I understand a few people from my ESO so to learn from them. It's an opportunity for me to learn and also understand and also discuss. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nitin, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions, so we will be opening the stage for Q&As and discussion. I have shared Nitin's email address uh, through our chat box. 
and if you have any questions and you would like to touch base with them you can always do it so i would say i think the first question came from jarrett if i pronounced uh, the name correctly and the second one from candice uh, jarrett if you are still uh, there and you want to go ahead please go ahead <clears throat> so i see the question so do you have a sense of small scale portable electricity storage and or microgrids for example portable this is a company in vancouver 25 20 50 kilowatt storage on wheels which can be combined with mobile solar 10 minutes setup uh, uh, sold to military off grid eight events film utility uh, i am an investor and also own a decentralized solar utility in ontario that is getting increased net meter off grid behind the meter customs <clears throat> okay uh, thank you J uh, jared first of all for finding time and attending. So <clears throat> my experience, like over the six years, I have been mainly focusing on uh, grid scale storage system, battery storage system. Uh, but uh, though I don't have any hands-on experience, uh, but what during this period of time, what I understood, like specifically we look into the case of uh, US, right? So there we have, <clears throat> uh, FERC has further come up with another order which allows aggregation. So when we talk about this scale of, storage in kilowatts so what it requires is to get maximum benefit maybe so, so at participating at the wholesale level it needs kind some kind of aggregation mechanism uh, but uh, it can also participate at the distribution level where uh, it can uh, get in co some contracts with the uh, ldcs so this is so my I, uh, to be honest i don't have any direct experience of any companies or idea of it, a general understanding of like how uh, behind the meter kind of arrangement can be done. Yeah, thank you, Nitin. And uh, the second question I think is from Candice. Oh, Jared also had a comment, I guess. I'm interested in connecting with Wise. So something for Wise to take up. Sure. Armagan? Yeah. Yep, no uh, problem. Yeah. And uh, then I think from Candice, there is another question. Uh, uh, so does the degradation cost function apply to both the charge and discharge of the battery? How did you construct the battery energy storage system arbitrage constraint? Is this based on a minimum price spread requirement? Okay. Uh, Conrad, uh, thank you, Conrad, again uh, for attending. So I would be happy to discuss uh, this in maybe offline or something. So the question, uh, thank you for your comment on the presentation too. So regarding degradation cost function. So the assumption is basically when we consider battery operation, right? So charging, discharging is a complete one operation. It, it is considered as one operation. So we need not account for degradation in both separately. So that is one assumption what I have made in my modeling. So I've considered that degradation only in discharging phenomenon. So that is for the first part of the question. Uh, for second part of the question, how did you construct the BSS arbitrage constraint? Is this based on minimum price spread requirement? So arbitrage constraint, basically, uh, the most important thing is uh, to ensure that uh, the state of charge, as I said, the state of charge of the battery uh, is so one thing is the standard op operational constraint which makes sure like it is within its uh, upper and lower soc level the second thing is uh, i have used some bidding uh, uh, bidding parameters which actually takes into account the state of charge of the battery so uh, so what i have proposed is the storage can participate to provide multiple services it can participate to provide uh, energy service and uh, spinning reserve service both, right? So how would it partition, basically, how much of its capacity would it uh, set aside for uh, energy provision and how much would be for spinning reserve provision? So that has been uh, through some parameters have done that. So uh, arbitrage constraint mainly focus on uh, how, how like, uh, mainly state of charge management. That is what looked into. And typically, the fact is, uh, it's an optimization, right? Optimization model. So to maximize it, the idea would be to charge during, so, min, so basically the idea is to maximize social welfare or in, uh, or in other words, minimize the cost, right? So cost, so uh, storage would basically would like to 
charge when or ma maximum charge when the price is low uh, at off peak hours make uh, so the assumption is, in my case in my models i consider like they start at a particular state of charge right so maybe at, uh, and they maintain it at the end of the same so from there they charge keep ready and they start discharging when it's maximum profitable for the system and for them too I'm not sure if I'm actually uh, able to be heard here. Well, uh, Conrad? Oh, yeah, you can hear yeah, yeah, me. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was hoping I wasn't just talking into the void. Yeah, great, uh, great presentation. And thanks for, uh, I, I definitely have a ton of questions that would probably uh, bore lots of people on this, uh, like very detailed questions. So perhaps we should chat uh, offline. But definitely. definitely we'd, yeah, I've definitely done a lot of thinking about this. This, this is very interesting because we see, uh, I was, I've been doing some work trying to figure out the value of storage in terms of its marginal cost. And I was relating it to kind of a quote fuel cost based on when it's, you know, being charged up. But, and this is sort of like a variable operations and maintenance kind of adder adding this yep. cost degradation uh, function, which I think makes a lot of sense. But then when I'm talking about an arbitrage concern, I thought you meant you had like, I guess it sounds like you've sectioned off portions of your, of your battery storage to provide different services. I think that's what you mean. Okay. I think I yes. see what you're doing. Just in terms of like, you know, revenue seeking, there's obviously a certain minimum spread between what it's charging at and what it's discharging at for it to be able to make any revenue, right? So there's, yes, of course, there's those sorts of constraints. And those so are the ones which are more interesting, because sometimes it makes sense to charge when it's 100 bucks, if you know, the next day is going to be 500 bucks, even though maybe the average is 20 over the month or something, you, you get these weird issues where you're charging at times where it seems like it's still high, but you still get revenue. So it trying to come up with like the marginal cost of a storage is something that I've been trying to tackle for a while. And it's, it's definitely yeah. not simple. Uh, so no, here, what I would say is, uh, so what I've done is I have captured the cost. I know my cost, right. But being participating into market, the bids being submitted hourly, right. So I yeah. know I, I'm also monitoring how the uh, historical prices are. So yeah. that is why I said I have parameters where I decide how much to offer. Okay. So, uh, if I see the price, are, the basic understand, typically it's going to be more during the off uh, the peak hours, right? For discharging, it's more suitable, most likely. Sure. But at that time also, I can, as a storage owner, I can decide like how much I can offer, uh, what portion of my uh, capacity I would offer for uh, during that time. So, so the bids and offers, do they still have, I guess what I'm trying to say, does it, does it boil it down to something which is totally related exclusively to costs of that system or is it an expectation of prices in the future that still comes into your bids and offer strategy no for now uh what i have considered is considering their actual cost of operation but uh the price which what you are talking about the second aspect is that is historical price that is also monitored but that's uh through the bid so what i'm trying to say is say i know my cost so i so to understand in simple way, price quantity pair right so how much would I like, what would be more beneficial at what time I need to offer and how much I would need to offer? That aspect comes from the uh, idea of historical prices. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Let's, let's keep this conversation going, hopefully. Okay. Perfect, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And now we have uh, another question from Candice. Candice, go ahead. Uh, hello, hello, Niti. Hello, everyone, can, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, I can, I can hear you clearly, please uh, uh, hello, I'm uh, uh, currently a PhD student like in the Faculty of Environment and doing the uh, related research on the electric vehicles and for energy storage. And I really like your presentation and it's very interesting and also cover different perspectives of energy storage. And currently I'm doing a research a project related to social acceptance of energy uh, storage. And I, I just want to ask, um, a general question that uh, I find uh, that in 2019, like the global, the new installed capacity of energy storage, um, like decreased from yes. 2018 and due to some regula uh, regulatory uh, like changes or shifts in uh, specific countries. Uh, so I just uh, like wondering how do you think of uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the energy storage, um, not only maybe technology, but also maybe market or policy perspective. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your uh, question, Candice. So my 
take on that would be uh, definitely with the covid the pandemic coming in it is impacting all walks of life right all businesses and every uh, all everything whatever you take from personal to all kind of uh, business right so obviously we are going to see a impact uh, in in the market area or uh, electricity uh, arena and also uh, i believe that will be seen on storage right but all it uh, what what is most important thing is uh, the kind uh, the because this is the, whatever happen is within a really short period of time and the kind of planning and vision that is more long time long term right so that might impact of course that might impact the kind of trend we had but in my view uh, this is definitely going to come back so like we saw the forecast also right so there was a dip but definitely it's going to come back Okay, I understand. So you think that maybe for uh like the COVID nineteen thing is just like um maybe to suffer a, a short period of time, but later it will still uh like increase for the new install capacity to be huge. Uh, it may because see, uh, this is something which we uh, actually face for the first time, right? So I was seeing like the the main the main reports are yet to come, but one thing in general, what we are seeing, there had been a shift. In the load pattern, right? The load during this time has been uh, seen to shift down. So obviously, uh, it all depends on how much you trade in the market, right? So if the trading is going to decrease, or uh, that is going to affect the business. But considering the fact that the kind of uh, value this adds, this resource adds to the system, I don't think this uh, is going to uh, draw it back. Though in the kind of revenue and all, we might see that for a few years, maybe a year or two. But after that, it is definitely going to come back. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot for your presentation, and I I will email you later. <laughs> Thanks Please, a lot. It would be my pleasure. Uh, okay, so thank you, Candice. Question. So there is another one from Farooq. Uh, yeah, Farooq. Farooq is asking, did you not include the round cycle efficiency in the cost function? Yes, I have included that. Uh, good question. Uh, but what I would like to mention here is, in my formulation, I considered them uh, it as a parameter. But uh, so this was uh, like the work I did say a year and a half ago. But after that, when I am in continuously interacting with uh, people working with different markets, and I understand this is a very very important. So you brought a very good point here. Yeah. So the round trip efficiency has a huge impact actually. So that would be very very interesting to see. Uh, so in my work, it's considered as a parameter, fixed, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, round trip. But uh, like all these will depend on, uh, uh, so that is a parameter in the cost function. Uh, you can see my cost formulation. So if that varies, it's going to uh, affect that too. So that is important to, uh, it would be interesting and also important to see what would be the impact of round, variation of round trip efficiency on this formulation. Very uh, I would say it's a very good question, and uh, definitely that can be considered as a research problem, uh, interesting research problem, very practically relevant to me. And I would also like to mention this, that Nitin's uh, talk will be posted on the WISE YouTube channel, which will be publicly available to everyone. Uh, so if you would like to have a copy, you can always go to our WISE YouTube channel, and uh, the video recording will be available shortly. So now we can go back uh, to our Q&A session. If you guys have any more questions, please go ahead. So I don't see any question in the chat for now. Mm -hmm. I, I guess no more questions. Uh, so in that case, I have shared Nitin's email address with everybody. And if you would like to touch base with Nitin or with Professor Kankar Bhattacharya, uh, who happened to be Nitin's PhD thesis supervisor, or myself, uh, my name is Armagan. I am the R&D manager with the Wartel Institute for Sustainable Energy. Our email addresses are available in the public domain. You can always touch base with us in regards to uh, power and energy sector R&D. Uh, I would like to thank Nitin for his wonderful presentation and thank you so much for sharing with us uh, great insights on battery energy storage systems and electricity markets. And I would also like to thank our participants, our audience, thank you so very much for joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.